and welcome to For the Love of Nature, a podcast where we tell you everything you need to know about nature, and probably more than you wanted to know. I'm Laura Fox LaPole. And I'm Katie Holloway. And today, we're talking about lovable, creepy crawlies. <laughs> I, in, the, in, the, in the nice way, not like the... I don't know. I feel like creepy crawlies. It's good. It's going to be good. We're going to yeah, yeah. sell I mean, you. It's lovable. How can... <laughs> <laughs> if it's lovable, it must be fine. We are going to sell you on insects today and why you should like insects. Or at least invertebrates. That invertebrates. Are, like, I don't know what most people call bugs. I would definitely yeah. say mine are bugs. Over In the generic insects. term. <laughs> we should probably explain that too. The, the difference between the two. Are you going to explain it at all? Uh, Insect versus no, bug? We could do it right now. Okay, go for it. Well... There's a couple different things. Uh, one, an insect, by definition, has to have six legs and antenna and three body parts. Um, when people refer to bugs, it's usually just a generic term for, you know, stuff that anything. lives under a rock or a log. Yeah, yeah. anything. <laughs> but I know there are true bugs, and I think yes. they're in the beetle family. Yes. But yes, I'm yes, not yes, worrying yes. about it. No. <laughs> yeah. So there is so there is a difference I mean, for in case anybody wants to get... As crazy as I get about ape versus monkey and venomous versus poisonous, where I oh, still yeah. like have to Triggered. correct. I <laughs> have to correct people. Somebody I work with who is a true Texan, so I'm in Fort Worth, Texas right now, and true Texan, and he said about a poisonous snake, and not even thinking, I just went venomous. And he was like, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, venomous. That's <laughs> my, my proudest moment is that now I get Justin to correct people on oh, that. Oh, whoa. Getting and the I'm husband like, to yes. correct people. <laughs> Stepped it's up. It's not poisonous. It's venomous. <laughs> it's venomous. But it is. So it's episode seven today, which, hey, it's episode seven. Most podcasts fail by this point. Yeah, and we're baby, still going. We can just get through this. We just gotta make it to the end. Don't jinx it. <laughs> just, just gotta last. Um, let me pull mine up. Okay, do you want to go first on your news? Sure, I'm ready. Go for it. All right. So to start off, we've got our nature news little segment, and mine is that um, a cephalopod has passed a cognitive test designed for human children. That's creepy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but so cool. Um, it's an article on ScienceAlert.com. So there's this, uh, this intelligence test or some along those lines um it's called the stanford marshmallow experiment and they usually give it to kids <laughs> oh, oh oh okay i know which one you're talking about i know what yeah, you're okay, so okay. a kid is placed in a room with a marshmallow yep. if uh they're told if they can manage not to eat it for 15 minutes they'll get a second one and then they can eat both so it's about delayed gratification and okay so what animals do they do this with a cuttlefish yeah, but, <laughs> but it's not marshmallows. So, oh, uh, I was hoping it was marshmallows. I was like, no, this is the that'd cutest be so cute. Test ever. <laughs> no, they said you can do it with animals, um, but usually it's not a matter of um, more food. It's a matter of better food. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they've they've that done some sense. experiments, um, and they've discovered that some primate some primates along with dogs. Although, and corvids have all mm -hmm. passed the marshmallow test. So they oh, learned yeah. that better food will come later. So it says that uh, last year, cuttlefish also passed a version of the marshmallow test. <laughs> I just, it's just, I can't get over, first of all, testing a cuttlefish. You know what yeah. I mean? Like just the fact that you're, you're testing them is cute in itself. That's so funny. Yeah. Continue. Um, it said that they refrained from eating a meal of crab meat in the morning once they learned that dinner was going to be something that they liked better, which was shrimp. Oh, oh. They so they would just not eat that morning. Yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> like Carl, that's like Carl, my husband, when he knows we're going to like a big good dinner place at night, he like will skip lunch because he's I like, definitely do that on the holidays. I got to make room. I got to make, <laughs> I got to make room. Got to, got to save up. Um, and it wasn't just that. It wasn't just the delayed gratification. Apparently, they were placed in a special tank with two chambers that had transparent doors, and the snacks were in there so that they could choose which one they preferred. Um, a raw king prawn or live grass shrimp. Hmm. Um, and uh, the doors had symbols on them that the cuttlefish had been trained to recognize. A circle meant the door would open right away. A triangle meant the door would open after time. Jeez. The fact that they can even do that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like people don't give them enough credit for it. Crazy. So yeah, um, they, I mean, I firmly believe that cephalopods would probably rule the planet Ugh. if it, 
was yeah. all ocean. Yes. Oh, for sure. I, for sure. I mean, octopi would rule us, but cuttlefish would definitely be like their lackeys. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. Hold on to yourselves, ladies. David Attenborough led <gasps> AR at brings extinct creatures to life. So wait, David what? Attenborough, he's voicing. Oh, a, okay. Yeah, it's that the title is this is from nerdist.com, but the title is David Attenborough led AR app led AR app brings extinct creatures to life. Yeah, that's what it says. Anyway, he's voicing an an app. So he's a narrator, of of course, of an app that brings its extinct species back. It's called Museum Alive. Ooh. And what it does is it um basic almost like the uh you know like the Jurassic Park game where oh, you yeah. could like I was you, into it. Yeah, where you could oh that's right. <laughs> you were That was into the it. one game that I did get into. Yes. <laughs> and so where Dark you can dinosaurs. Right? And where you can hold your phone up and and see him and stuff. It's sort of like the same thing only with extinct species. And and so he is the um the the narrator for it. Um, Perfect. I want to listen to his wonderful voice all the time. Right? That's why I said, hold on to yourselves, ladies. Here comes <laughs> David Attenborough again. Um, <laughs> oh, bless him. So in other news, since we're talking about random other things, um, of things that I can pronounce. So in the tree episode, I had mentioned about earthing and how going out barefoot, how you're supposed to feel a lot more grounded and everything. And then I mentioned earthing and grounding. So... I did some research and found out that they're actually two separate things, although similar concept. And I actually found a two in one, <laughs> a two in one set on Amazon that I'm not going to get. But we're going to start adding to this news section, news section. Um, sometimes we'll talk about nature news, and then we're going to start throwing in some random things. Like I got a book that talks all about earthing. And I'm going to try it. I'm going to do 30 days. It's they say you have to do 30 minutes outside earthing and I'm going to I'm going to do a report and we'll put it on I'll start doing that on the in, on Instagram on the oh, cool. Instagram. On, on the Instagram. <laughs> I'm a millennial. We're getting too old for this. Um <laughs> but I'll put it on Instagram. Um and I'll kind of document in here too, but I'll sort of document on Instagram. Um I don't know. Just if 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 I notice a difference, they say that if you're you're doing earthing, and uh, you, it, it stops inflammation. It's supposed to like have all these kinds of health benefits. So I'm gonna I'm gonna try it now. Grounding, on the other hand, I don't think I'm. I have a, a heart arrhythmia condition, and so I don't think I should try this one because this is the one. It's like a mat that you like plug. One of them was a mat that you plug into your outlet. And then you put your feet on it. And then there was another one where you put, you plug it into the outlet and then you put like patches on your body. I yeah. don't feel comfortable <laughs> doing that <laughs> with the heart arrhythmia. I, you know what? Maybe it'll shock me back into rhythm. Maybe that's what's wrong with me. I just need to do some grounding. Yeah, um, sink. But I, that one just, it, it makes me a little bit skeptical. But the thought process is, is that people who don't have access to soil, grass, earth, do grounding and you can do it in your home and so it's supposed to give you the same benefits but i'm just gonna do the earthing for 30 days and yeah, uh, man, you're in texas it's getting warm there oh it, it getting warm i mean past you know the mild apocalypse that we just had a few weeks ago where all of texas was falling apart in the snow um Two days later, it was, you know, 70 and sunny, like late that weekend. Mm. Yeah, it was. So it's it's been Lucky. nice. It's been in the 70s. But I mean, hey, it's Texas. So yeah, I'm definitely going to take advantage. So make sure you're following us on Instagram at FTLON uh, podcast and follow us on there and I'll be giving updates. And then we, we will start to throw in like these, I, maybe like, like our own myth busters. Hopefully that term isn't copyrighted and we just got ourselves <laughs> sued but but we're gonna kind of do like our own myth like our own nature of myth buster so if you guys have ideas or if you have things that you're like hey i heard about xyz let us know like reach out to us let us know and, and we'll give it a try because i'm yeah. i'm excited about this i definitely am willing to like learn about new things and new practices and products that for sure I'd be willing to try yeah 
for sure. Just not plugging myself into an outlet. That one, yeah. that's kind of where I draw the line. line at some things. <laughs> Personal harm, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. The whole point of this episode is we want to kind of pitch to you guys and, and those of you who don't like insects or bugs, um, bring you to the side that, that hopefully you at least have at least a little bit more of appreciation. Yeah, uh, if you're going to, like, we originally thought, you know, you could consider these as, like, starter bugs. Yes, starter you know, bugs, yes. To just get you on the creepy crawly train, which is the best train. <laughs> the creepy crawly train. Well, <laughs> speaking, though, of of starter bugs, this one could literally be a starter bug because a lot of people do raise them. And I'm going to be talking about monarch butterflies. Ooh, oh, come on. How can you not... Man, See? Katie, you cheated with a butterfly. I, Everybody already likes them. <laughs> not, not, not really. Not really. Remember, you and I, ha- we do have a mutual friend who hates oh, yes, butterflies. You're who's right. Ter- a mutual friend who's afraid of butterflies. Who's terrified of butterflies. So not everybody likes monarch butterflies or butterflies in, in general. Um, and if she who shall remain nameless wants to oust herself as hating butterflies, I know she follows us on our social media platforms. <laughs> Please so, do. <laughs> so she can, she can name herself um and this would be a good test to see if she listens to every episode too this is her test yeah tell everyone tell everyone why why don't you like butterflies and hopefully i can change your mind probably not since you're a grown adult and still hate them but (laughs) (laughs) but but maybe maybe this will help maybe i can be a little bit more persuasive here all right so monarch butterflies uh for those of you don't know they're orange and black in appearance and weigh less than half a gram uh, their wingspan is four inches, or if you're not geo, they can pair them to the size of a teacup. Um, oh. They can be found from northern South America up through Central America, the U.S. and Canada. Um, and I did not know this, but they can also be found in eastern Australia. Uh, New really? Z- yep. Eastern Australia, New Zealand, Indonesian islands, and Oceania. Did not Natively? know. Natively? Hmm? Natively? Yeah, they're there now. Uh. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so if you look up like monarch like habitat distribution that's all i googled and it came up yeah I, I did not know um josh <laughs> we just we our artist josh who is draws all the amazing artwork for us including our um cover art and everything he is our insect knowledge guru of anything bugs and insects so um we'll just probably have a whole episode after this episode that's issuing all the corrections from the facts that we give in this <laughs> one episode so but he'll be able to say if they're native or not but they're there i mean it was on all the list so um in in the u.s though they are known for their large migration patterns mm-hmm. um so for for those who don't know um you know butterflies they start as caterpillars and go through the life cycle which is four stages to become a butterfly um, so in butterfly form, they will travel between 1,200 and 2,800 miles in Canada um, and the U.S. down to central Mexico where they gather in large groups. Um, I and mean, that's only the eastern variety, right? Because the western hibernates in California. Yes, 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 yes. Good distinction to make. Um Another distinction is that they obviously don't do this in their caterpillar form, <laughs> but <laughs> oh my gosh, that'd be terrifying! Right? Just like swarm. <gasps> Josh needs to draw that one too. Can Joshua? Can you draw oh a gosh. hitchhiking caterpillar? <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine the carnage? Out? Can you can you imagine the absolute carnage if it was a caterpillar migration? <laughs> it just ew. Everywhere. Oh my gosh. That's like so again, Western PA tent worms or what are what are their actual names? They have an actual uh, name. Don't, but you know I don't what? know. We call we call them tent caterpillars. Yeah, okay. So hopefully everybody knows what we're talking about. And whenever those come cuz some years they come out in like huge swarms, other years they don't. Yeah. And I feel like it would be that where it's like you can't get away from them, where they're just everywhere. I feel like that's what it would be like. But so monarch butterflies, they migrate as butterflies, not caterpillars. But Joshua, please draw a hitchhiking caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So like Laura said, the eastern variety, um, they hibernate in Mexico, which is the milder climate, or the western in California. Um, and if you haven't seen pictures of monarchs in Mexico, please do. It is it's s- freaking incredible. It's so amazing. Um, and I know if, you know, if butterflies freak you out, maybe you don't want to watch it, but I would just love to go and just sit. Oh my gosh. I've been, I, Ugh. it's so funny that you bring this up because I went on, I go through like phases where I'm like really into the monarch butterfly thing and then I forget about it for a while and then I mm-hmm. learn about it some more and I'm like oh my gosh I, I this past year was just thinking man you know it wouldn't even be that hard to go to Mexico it wouldn't no. even be that expensive let's no. just go that would be cool I don't know if it's protected land or not that would be the um only- I don't th- I think you can take certain excursions like guided excursions to there um because I don't know, but I've heard there are so many you can hear them yes. flap. Yeah. And that I've they heard break the branches. There's so yes. many on the branches. Which would also be really sad because I'll get into kind of like, I mean, they're not doing so hot right now <laughs> as far as um, population wise. And then, you know, they're down there and they're in such huge groups that they break branches. And then do they all fly off or do they, is there fatalities? I don't know. But probably most fly, but yeah, you I'm would sure think. Some. But you never know. But anyway, yeah, so it's just so, I mean, it's so many. Please look it up. It's it's awesome. Um, and, I mean, I, I would, if I traveled, you know, 1,200, 2,800 miles, I would want to, like, chill with a bunch of friends, too, and just be like, look what, look what we did. Um, so the migration, though, the, it's not a normal migration. Um, they're, the migrations are often multi-generational. Mm-hmm. Um, where they will migrate part of the way, then their off- offspring will go the rest of the way. That's what's the most, one of the most mind-blowing things to me. It is. Because, like, how do they know? Yes, right? So It's not uh, like, you know, some animals, like, they'll migrate and then they'll go back to the same place the next year. Yeah. No. This is not the same insect. No. This is its, like, its offspring. It's crazy. So, uh, the average lifespan is six to eight months of the caterpillar to butterfly hole. Six to eight months. The butterfly phase only lasts a matter of weeks. So that's why it's like the multi-generational. So even though, you know, it's eight months, the total lifespan, the butterfly phase is a matter of week. So, so yeah, so it's only six to eight weeks, uh, or sorry, six, I said about six weeks, I think is what the average was maybe. And I know, isn't like one of them, there's like, there's different, not versions, but I don't know what you want. What do they call them? There's, like, different generations. There's, like, oh, yeah, generation. Yeah. And one of the generations lives longer than the other yes, ones. Yes, 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 I don't. I don't know. Josh, <laughs> that's what I said. We're going to have to <laughs> issue a whole correction. Listen, guys, we researched this stuff, but we're not experts. <laughs> yeah, entomologists. We are nothing, not even close. Um, but I will say, though, speaking of being researched, do you remember in college that direction project that we did? And under that our undergrad oh, advisor yeah, made us course. do. So we, our undergrad advisor, he drove a bunch of blindfolded students around in a <laughs> in white, a giant white van, a giant white van, zigzagging through back streets to try and throw off our sense of direction. And then we finally stopped somewhere, and we had to get out. And he spun us around, and we had to tell him where North was, how far from the school we were, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, and that year, the year that we did it, he said that that was the first time that cops weren't ever called on him. And he's a pretty <laughs> he's a pretty big jo- jokester, but I also kind of believed him anyway. But it goes back to the point of like how do, how do they know? Like yeah. I I have a great sense of direction, but that is definitely by me figuring things out. Um, and I pay attention. I don't rely on a GPS. Because what is it? The more they did that, sur- they did a research. Scientists did a study on taxi drivers. And, and I believe it. Remember, and did directional, and they had some completely rely on GPS and others not. And so you're, I think it, it's a part of your brain that those neurons, they actually get weakened um, because they're not using it. But I, I couldn't find, I'll have to dig deeper. Uh, I well, g- I mean, like, you know, but at least humans, we learn to We navigate. learn. Right. They're butterflies. <laughs> They're born knowing. Because, <laughs> I mean, but but birds, they have an apparatus to help them. Di- directional. Right. With magnetic stuff. Yeah. I just, I, I, I should, maybe I should have dug deeper on the, the monarchs. But anyway, I mean, it, because it is multi-generational, so it has to be 
how yeah. their genetic... It's got to be something, I would think, something physiological. Yes, other than just like, hey, this is where we go. Um. So anyway, so yeah, it, it's... It's just, it's just amazing. Multi-generational. They eventually get down there, and that's where they hibernate. Another fun fact about monarchs is that when they are in the caterpillar form, they will actually headbutt each other for food. <laughs> that's so cute. <laughs> right? So because milkweed, which is their primary food source, is so scarce, um, I guess they have to become pretty competitive. So a friend of mine actually sent me that article, and so I had to, I had to mention it because I just imagined headbutting caterpillars, which is yeah, really Yeah, and cute. they've got their little, like, curvy antenna that right? look like tiny little little bull horns <laughs> right just, just <laughs> each other's uh, all right so what, be whatever the squishy noise is equivalent to that <laughs> 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 all right so what makes headbutting monarch such a great intro lovely crawly creepy crawly besides them being butterflies and who would be afraid of that um well first and beautiful of- <laughs> yeah, and, and beautiful. They are really beautiful. Um, so first of all, monarchs are raised by people all the time. Um, if you listen to the very first episode, you hear of about mine and Laura's aspirations of owning a butterfly farm. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, you can order caterpillars online. You can take care of them, watch them grow, and and release them. Um, so it's a it's a hands on insect that. It really isn't scary. Um, a great opportunity for kids um, to go ahead and watch them grow throughout their stages and become a butterfly. Uh, and, and it is it's a patience task for kids for sure. Um, and then Josh, who I ran, was getting ideas from from this episode. He even said that monarchs have also been known to become pretty friendly around people who keep the misemerged oh. one as pets. So that's so cute, right? Um, but I also, I should have asked him what Miss Emerged mean. Like, <laughs> what happens? Uh, I think that means, like, when they, when they molt, something happens, and so they don't come out normal. But, but yes, but what does that, what does not normal, like, is it, is it a halfling? Like, is it a, <laughs> in between, like, <laughs> well, I don't know, I've seen, like, a cricket who's, like, you know, missing a leg, or its wings are all crinkled. Or is it I would in assume it's something stages. with crinkled wings. Okay, okay. I was like, or is it, like, is it half, is it, is it half caterpillar, half Oh my god! You know what I mean? Like, is it so? Yeah, I'm sure that's not it. But. <laughs> <laughs> Can we pretend for a little bit that that's it? Um, but yeah, so raising them, and then you can you can release them. Um, there's tagging programs that you can be a part of. Um, and so if if you're looking for a way to enjoy insects, and you can have a hands on conservation approach to helping the environment by adding more pollinators to the area. Um, another reason that makes them lovely is, um, there's a huge misconception of people thinking every insect will bite and or sting them. And so Mm -hmm. while, while yes, anything with a mouth can bite, um, I have found several different sources that said that monarchs won't bite you. Do they actually have a mouth though? Or is it just a tongue? I think it's or like, I, well, technically if it's coming out of a, if the tongue is, all right, yeah, <laughs> the tongue is coming out of something, um, but it is mostly a tongue. So they can't really like bite you. I think with people, if you were to hold a butterfly, the creepy part is like the feet, like yep. the scratchy little feet. Um, and I know that they like, you know, they like salt. So like sometimes they do send out their little tongue to like lick. Yeah. And so <laughs> which I, might be disconcerting. <laughs> yeah. If you're okay with scratchy feet and licking, then, then you might like then a butterfly. It's magical. <laughs> yeah, right? But I, but that's at least more of a mental block. You know what I mean? Like yeah. scratchy feet yeah, yeah. and it licking you, that's completely harmless. So it's yeah. it's mental over physical pain. It's not like hey, I'm going to like wasps, and so I'm going to go out there (laughs) and hold one and hope it doesn't hurt me. No, like this one, it's totally a mental block because it it really can't hurt you. Um, So if you can remain calm and it lands on you, or if, if you raise them to release them, then, you know, they can't hurt you. I actually just learned about uh, monarchs this year. They're and maybe I'd heard of it before, but actually, like, watched a really good video on the uh, cultural significance for Day of the Dead in Mexico with monarchs. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, 
So it just so happens, it, like weirdly enough, that migration is perfectly timed with the Day of the Dead, that they arrive in Mexico on that day, or at least on either side of it. Interesting. Um, and so monarch butterflies are viewed as souls. Well, they um, are bright. Has- they are bright orange. And I mean, that's I forget the name of the flower is that's associated with Day of the Dead. But I mean, that's also bright orange yeah. as well. So the yeah. so the they're it's hmm. um like the monarch butterflies are associated with the souls of departed family members who've come back. That's awesome. Yeah, it did was, not know really that. Beautiful. You'll have to look it up. Yeah, definitely will. Um, because I know there's some significance. I have, to, I have to look that up too. But I know there is some significance with the flowers. And the petals and the colors and things like that. Um, yeah. Because it's a very colorful celebration. Um, So, all right. I think that wraps up everything, the basics of monarchs. So, if you're looking for a hands-on approach to your hatred for insects, uh, these could be your pals. And you can help the environment and get over your fears. So, double double whammy. Nice. Mine isn't... Um, I'm My next one... Well, my first one isn't as altruistic as that, but... In my opinion, this is the starter, (laughs) this is the starter bug of all starter bugs. And it's not actually a bug, but we'll get into that. Um, And that is roly polies. Uh, Oh, roly polies. Or wood louses, however you want to call, whatever you want to call them. Um, So I grew up lifting rocks and peering at what was underneath of them. And roly polies were like one of the most common sightings. Oh, yes. yes. One of the first, what I thought was a bug, one of the first bugs I ever learned. Uh, and I really enjoyed picking them up and watching them roll around in my hand. Yeah. It was a completely harmless, yes. you know, I was being gentle. They were being kind. Like <laughs> They were being kind. Actually, they were terrified. And they oh, just. I, you're right. I'm sure they were totally, <laughs> they just, totally terrified. had no other way to let you know besides curl up in a ball. <laughs> <laughs> and and hope that they die peacefully. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no. So what what are roly polies? Well, another name for the species is a pill bug, um, which is in fact not a bug or even an insect. <laughs> they are actually. So you cheated on this episode. It's all a lie. Yeah. <laughs> um, they are terrestrial crustaceans. That's right. They're land shrimp. <laughs> Josh <laughs> T-shirt. <laughs> Land shrimp. <laughs> they're not really land shrimp, but they are related to shrimp. Um, so they're in the same family as crabs and, you know, stuff like that. They're Here also known as woodlice. They are what we are going to call them land shrimp. Land shrimp. <laughs> land shrimp. <laughs> land shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> they're also known as woodlice in Europe since they're normally found under logs. Um, they are, you know, just a little bit of natural history. They're brown gray in color with two antenna, seven pairs of legs which is what makes them not an insect. A <laughs> segmented one body. extra leg. <laughs> wait, one, wait, 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 wait. They have seven pairs. Oh, seven pairs. <laughs> I thought you said seven legs. I was like, well, no wonder. They always curl up in a ball. It's like because they get stuck in a... <laughs> that would be a really weird... <laughs> um... There are, uh, about, they grow to be, uh, 0.3 to 0.7 inches. So really tiny. Um, and there is another species of woodlouse that looks a lot like it hmm. called the sow bug. And I always thought that was just the same thing. Like I oh, thought sow bugs and roly polies were the same thing. I would have to look up a picture to see. Um, they, they look almost identical, but they've got like tiny little tails. And so they can't roll into a ball. So, so if you the pick it tail up is and preventing it rolls into them? a ball, yeah. <laughs> if you pick it up and you roll into a ball, it's a pill bug. If it doesn't, it's a sow bug. <laughs> it's a sow bug. Uh, all because um, of that origi- tail. <laughs> Originally, they're from Europe, but they can now be found literally all over the world. I did um, not know that. Me neither. I figured with as many as we have, they'd have to be native. Because they nope. are everywhere. I mean, yeah. every. That's like as common. So... I, you know, we've been in Texas almost three years now, and I realized maybe six, seven months ago that I haven't seen a mole, and I don't know how long, because I've been in the south so long, but that's like the yeah. same thing. You dig up north, and it's like, I'm going to hit a mole, and I feel <laughs> like, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about. They're everywhere, and I feel like I'm pill, gonna- <laughs> I feel like. I feel like pill bugs are the same way. Like, you're going to pick up a rock, I'm, oh, I'm going to yeah. see a pill bug. Guaranteed pill bug. Yeah. yeah. 
crazy. Um, I, I, I just thought that they were they were native deer. Yeah, hmm. me too. I'm gonna feel really dumb if that's incorrect, but I swear Josh. from what I was reading, it says that they are non native. <laughs> um, they are technically nocturnal, uh, which is why you find them under rocks and logs <laughs> during the day. They're probably super mad to be interrupted. Yeah, right? They're sleeping, <laughs> trying yeah, to rest up so they can feed at night, and we're just picking them up and playing with them. Yeah. Um, what I thought was so cute, and I've never, ever heard of, this was the most mind-blowing thing for me, when they're tiny eggs, their mom actually carries them around in a tiny pouch. Aw, like a little They have purse pouches. <laughs> they're like roly-poly kangaroos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come here, babies. Just hold them all. But instead of having just like one baby in there, they got a one to two hundred of them. Holy crap! Yep. So and once they hatch, they stay in that pouch until they're big enough. Wow. So she's carrying around like two hundred holy poly babies. babies in this tiny pouch. And this poor mom, like, just love, like, just, uh, just like dragging <laughs> a pouch of babies. <laughs> and that's the other thing that I see. thought was really surprising is that roly polies can live two to five years. Okay. Did not, definitely did right? not know you that. you think, okay, a tiny bug, like, we're talking a couple months, maybe. So, nope. chances Years. are, the same rocks that we were living, and to be fair, I mean, I was never looking for roly-polies. I was always looking for salamanders and things. Something a little bit more interesting, but <laughs> it, I always checked the same rocks. I wonder if right. they're this. I wonder if they're the same individuals. Like, what is their range? Like, yeah, you know what I mean. I like mean, a, probably if it's if they got enough food, why would they leave? Exactly. So, like you probably watch generations of roly and I grow didn't up even and know have families, and <laughs> yeah. and I didn't even know. We're just picking them up and poking them, and it could be you know great grandpa over here, and it's the same as those red mites that right? we were talking about. Those, yeah, uh, we were talking. Um, so anyway, why are they significant? Why do roly polies matter? Well, in the grand scheme of things, um, I think some would argue that they don't. But <laughs> everything has a purpose. <laughs> Except for are, mosquitoes. I'm still working on that one. Yeah, yeah. They are decomposers that feed on dead and decaying matter. Which is ve- which is incredibly important. Right. Decomposers, I mean, one, we don't want dead stuff laying all around. And two, that's the only way nutrients get back in the soil. Do you remember, so, there is a statistic out there, and gosh, I wish I could remember that it said if we got rid of all the decomposing insects... Or land shrimps out there, how much <laughs> how much dead stuff would be on the forest floor? It would be like an insane, um, like oh, yeah, like it, it would be an insane amount. Like eventually, other things would decompose it. But if you just got got rid of one group of decomposers, it would it would just throw the whole system off. I'm sure. I'm sure. So they are super um, important. Then one study found that like there actually has been some studies on them and one has shown that they are definitely beneficial to forests as a whole as they do return nutrients to the soil so Hmm. roly polies matter (laughs) roly polies matter that's all i gotta say all righty i wasn't expecting you to do land shrimp but (laughs) i'm gonna forever call it a land shrimp that's awesome i I never would have thought to do do uh pill bugs roly polies for this one Good. They're just, it was so nostalgic for me, like, yeah. being like, oh, like, it was nostalgic, but also mind-blowing, because I didn't know some of those things. Yeah, no, I, I, and again, it's the same thing, like, with insects, for me, it's always how long they can live, because you yeah. you never think about insects living that long, because, I mean, to be fair, so many of them don't. Um, well, right, and like, you know, as a as a pretty general rule, at least with mammals, the smaller something is, the less time it lives. Yeah. So, like, I just extrapolate that to be like, oh, well, insects are really tiny, yeah, so they probably they're even don't live at tinier. all. Yeah, tinier. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty, so my second lovely creepy crawly are ladybugs. I knew, I, I, I knew. Yep. I knew. I, I was figured, a, I figured if one of us didn't cover ladybugs, the other one would, out. right? Yeah. yeah. I, and I was shocked whenever I... I asked Kim uh, this. I gave her these two. Or I gave her another, another one, and then this was the second one. Um, so ladybugs, or as they're known by their Irish name, Boyne Day. I'm probably butchering that to add. Oh the, my god! Add, Why do you even bring up names that you're? Because <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say it because it means God's little cow. What? <laughs> yes. Why? I don't. Well, 
Oh, no, I don't think I know the answer to that one. I know the <laughs> other. I know the other nickname that they have, and I went into the reasoning for that. But I don't know why they're called God's little cow. Joshua. Yeah. Josh was the one who told me, and I. Fact, I mean, the I fact only checked. reason. The only thing I can think of is that they have spots, and so do cows. Maybe. Maybe. Like. It's, it's B B O I N space D. Oh, wait. 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 Oh no! Wait. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. I was <laughs> gonna so say. Close. I was gonna say. Don't they milk aphids? But they do eat aphids. Th- then the then the aphids would be cows. Yes, not them. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> not them. But they're called God. Okay, disregard. Disregard. Probably because of the spots. It's, it probably really is that easy. All right. So there are about five thousand different species of ladybugs in the world, um, and can be found in a variety of habitats, from grasslands and forests to suburbs, cities, and along rivers. Basically everywhere. Yeah. Um, they're also known as lady beetles or ladybird beetle. Um, they can be found in every single color of the rainbow, which is fascinating. Like every Whoa, single I color. I want to find a blue or purple one. Right? Ask Josh. He'll tell you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> or he could probably find it. He probably see, get us I one. I see. I see some like at work. We get we get actual like ladybugs, and then we get the like the invasive oh. lady beetles that are like orange. Yes. Yes. So I, I've definitely seen orange and orangey yellow. Hmm. But I, I will have to look. I'm sure Josh can help us find. We will spam our account with insect photos after this episode because <laughs> we'll have Josh help us out. Um, so most people love them because they're small and they appear harmless to humans. Um, there's also the <laughs> saying, appear harmless? <laughs> yeah, they appear. Well, I'm going to get into that. They are point okay. that you, um, well, I'll get into it. Okay. So there's also a saying that if one lands on you, it's good luck. I think every grandparent has ever told their grandchild that, yeah. um, but to other insects, their bright colors, um, as always, bright colors are a warning signal. Um, if they're eaten by another insect, they release an oily, foul-smelling, foul-tasting fluid from their leg joints. Yeah, I've definitely had it on my fingers, so, uh, for sure. Which, which, I couldn't smell it, but I could see it. Which, I mean, but think, okay, so let's just pause for a second. First of all, that is why they are, appear harmless, but they're not. Um, I mean, at least they just stink on you. Yeah, they just they're they're foul tasting, gross fluid from their leg joints, which is really yeah. weird. Because I okay, so I don't sweat much at all, like <laughs> like medically. Doctors don't know why. Um, but once I got pregnant, I could finally sweat, which was kind of nice because I always feel like I'm in a sauna when I run. Um, but one of the few places now that I do sweat are my knees. So like knee pits, like the knee pits. In the front of my knees, what? like the my front of your knees, yes, like the like my knees. <laughs> so, what? so I imagine like a big predator coming towards me, and I'm a ladybug, <laughs> and then that's when my knees start sweating. That is the weirdest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> but, but that's what they do. They they sweat. They like secrete. No, not them. I can accept it from the ladybug. <laughs> it's <laughs> your it's <laughs> your knees. <laughs> you can't accept my knee sweat. <laughs> I'll take a picture next time. I'm working out. <laughs> take a picture. I have my barely there knee sweat for you. <laughs> so, so anyway, so why are they great, lovely, creepy crawlies? Um, again, it's they're really not intimidating. Um, in fact, they're extremely useful. So farmers um, were the first ones to coin ladybugs with the name ladybugs. Um, farmers love ladybugs because um, they're expert pest control. So when pests start to eat their crops, um, they would pray to the Virgin Mary. Shortly after the prayers, uh, ladybugs would come in and eat all the insects. So they started calling them Beetle of Our Lady. I have never heard that. Mm-hmm. So which, that makes total sense. Side note, why hasn't that been a Catholic high school name? Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, being lady? a Catholic, how have I never heard the origin of the lady? <laughs> <laughs> right? I feel like that was a missed opportunity by like a Catholic nature school. Yeah. If there ever was one, which there should be. Beetle of it Our Lady. Our, our Lady of what? It's Beetle of Our Lady. Oh, Beetle of Our Lady. Yeah. Totally should have been a school name. All right. So ladybugs, they love to eat aphids, like Lois said earlier, um, and other plant-eating pests. Um, So even if you're a backyard gardener, um, you get aphids, and it's all over. I 
hate freaking aphids. I had the most amazing broccoli plants last year, and I, I'm fairly hands-off gardener, a.k.a. I suck. Um, but, <laughs> so I just say I'm hands-off. Um, but I had incredible broccoli, and within a couple days, I kid you not, aphids in there destroyed yeah. them. Um, if I would have known that ladybug, I would have just ran around our house collecting ladybugs. And I'm yeah. going to have to be more intentional about catching them. Your job. Yeah, catching them and then throwing them out in the garden this year. Um, but I but I lost the whole thing. And I'm just like a, you know, a hobbyist. I just did it because it was fun. Yeah, yeah. But aphids can be obviously devastating to, to farmers. Um, so, you know, for us it's fun. But for farmers, they were really important. So, I mean, they could lose their whole livelihood in, in one, one swoop. So um, one single ladybug can actually eat up to 5,000 insects in its lifetime. Um, they, wow. or yeah, aphids, aphids in its lifetime, which is a lot for how small they are. I mean, aphids are small too, but ladybugs, yeah, they're not still, that big. Yeah. Um, I mean, an aphid's pretty big compared to a ladybug. It, it, yes. And to eat, five, like, to eat 5,000 of them. Yeah. I mean, I, that would be like, I wonder how many. I would think it would be at least like a goat size to us. Yeah. Okay. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. About. A goat, 5,000 goats in my lifetime. I have to start counting how many goats me, my mostly vegetarian diet consumes. Um, but they're often not eaten by others because of their dome-shaped body, which makes it hard for other insects to eat them. So they're super beneficial um, as far as farmers see them, but we're not. So if you're looking for a beneficial, pretty much harmless, comes in every color of the rainbow, nice, lovely, creepy, crawly, Give uh give ladybugs a try, native ones. Native ones. Choose choose your native yeah. your local native ladybug. Because yeah, yeah. I know that um, I uh, I don't remember how long ago, but that was one of the solutions they thought of to get rid of the woolly adelgid. Oh yeah, on hemlock trees. Mm-hmm. They were like, I know, let's release this species of ladybug. <sighs> when eat is the that woolly ever? Adelgid. When has that ever <laughs> worked? Never. And they didn't. <laughs> but uh. yeah. The only reason why I picked them is because I found a point why they're u- useful. <laughs> that was, <laughs> yeah, but they're useful. They're, they're nice to have around. And whenever I saw a Beetle of Our Lady, I was like, did not know that either. So I figured I needed to throw that out to our resident Catholic on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, um. Well, that leads to my last one, uh, which is one of my all-time favorite creepy crawlies probably is my all-time favorite creepy crawly and that's earthworms hey listen i had earthworms first but you had called it (laughs) hey (laughs) because who doesn't like well okay that's why would i say that most people don't like worms (laughs) let me to tell you my earthworm after this too okay good so i have always loved worms when I was very young, I wanted to be a worm farmer someday. Like, I literally remember saying that as, like, a career choice, that I was okay, going to be a worm farmer. But, what, like, what was the purpose? Is this, like, fish bait, or is it, like, so No, worms? no. Okay. It was because I thought worms were cool. Laura and her tackle shop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. I actually, um, I did go fishing with my dad a bit, but I hated putting worms on the hook because I felt so bad for them, so I'd always make him do it. Yeah. A, a lot so of like kids, w- I think, have that struggle. It would not have been for the tackle. Yeah. It would have been <laughs> for, like, now knowing what I know, I probably would have raised worms for, like, composting yeah, or, right. you know, yeah. like, gardening. Um, And I used to, I used to and still do rescue worms on sidewalks when it rains. <laughs> I think every human, if you are human, you should rescue earthworms on sidewalks. That's just Good. our human responsibility. I and, and, like, I... <laughs> When I was a kid, it was, like, obsessive. I had to save all of them. But I remember being in college, walking from the dorms to classes. Impossible. And giant earthworms. And I'd be like, okay, I can so many. a couple. I just can, a couple. I can do this. I can do this. <laughs> just running around. So I just just save a couple. And I also was, like, um, what you might call, like, a worm advocate. I'd get really upset. A worm like, advocate. I, I remember in elementary school when two when some boys ripped a worm apart and uh. I freaked out on them. I was like, what are you doing? Don't you know I can feel pain? And Are, like, are you still a worm advocate, would you say? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I teach about worms now and how amazing they are. So, yes. <laughs> yes, I would consider myself a worm advocate. I kind of want a badge. <laughs> worm advocate badge? Yeah, worm <laughs> like advocate. A, like an ex- open up your own, like, explorer program? Yeah, Maybe yeah. Worm advocate is one of your badges? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So what's the big deal about worms? Uh, Because, Laura, you're making a big deal out of them. (laughs) The common earthworm, again, is native to Europe, but it can now be found all over North America and Western Asia. So there are 7,000 species of earthworms, but the common earthworm is the one that's native to Europe. Okay, okay. In the United States, one square yard of earth in either a grassland or a forest might have 100 to 500 worms living in it. Crazy. So one square yard. so much. Maybe 500 worms in it. My dad Um, used to have a thing that fishermen use. It was given to him by somebody, so he didn't, I don't think he went out and bought this, but it would like shock the earth. (laughs) And then he would grab. Like like they do for fish? Yeah. It would like shock the earth and all the worms would come up and you could just grab them all. (laughs) Dang. (laughs) Right? Sorry to um, sorry to talk about this to our worm advocate. <laughs> <My> worm. <sighs> um, in terms of mass or weight, worms are the main type of creature found in most soils. <sighs> so, like, yeah. they're the heaviest thing. If you dig up a whole bunch of soil, it's worms. Um, so, they're also not an insect. Um, they're not a bug. And they're not a crustacean, either. <laughs> they are... <laughs> Surprisingly <laughs> enough, they're not a crustacean. <laughs> They're an annelid, which is in the group consisting of segmented worms. So earthworms are brownish in color, duh, few inches long. Although some have reached fourteen inches, which I, was I think say, is pretty crazy. I was just gonna say, I was That's hoping a monster that, worm. I was gonna, ho- I was hoping you would say that because there, yeah, there are some species that are huge, and those ones are a, I would say, a little bit creepier. I agree. I would be. Um, I I don't know if I'd be okay with a fourteen inch worm. Yeah, that's that. That's getting like scary. What, what is your worm <laughs> inch? <laughs> what's your what's your cap? For I would take a healthy six inch worm, <laughs> and I probably cap it that. <laughs> Six inches. I'm done. I'm done. Because <laughs> then it's just like a big, squishy, slimy, I don't know, like a... Ugh, like a, that, yeah, like okay. a snake? Like, like a tentacle, <laughs> but like, yeah, like a... It's like a snake, but in a bad way. Essentially, at that point, it's a snake. I know, right, I get it segmented, but... At a that, slimy snake. Yeah. Like... Ew. Do you want to um, hear my anyway. worm story now? Real quick. Yeah, go for it. (laughs) So, because as you're giving all these facts, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, There was a a group, so to get kids riled up, a bunch of kids riled up for a fundraiser, if they raise so much money, um, I don't know, the co-teacher I was with, um, we were at, this is when I was working at a museum and we were doing a program, and um, to get kids all raised up, riled up for this fundraiser, um, I just very spontaneously, I had mentioned to her that in college, I wanted to do a, my final research project on mealworms and the benefits of adding mealworms to your diet and how, how they have so much more protein than regular meat. And so on stage and she's getting all the kids pumped up and she was like, if you raise X amount, and I guess one of the kids was like, what are you going to give us? Cause that's how kids are. Like they want to, yeah. if, if you reach a goal, they want something. And so she was like, uh, uh, Katie will eat a mealworm. And I was like, yeah, sure. I'll eat a mealworm. And then they were like, well, what if we get X raise this much money? And she was like, uh, Katie will eat a cricket. I'm like, since when am I going <laughs> to, and I'm just, will I? yeah, I'm just back. I'm like, sure. And the top one was if they reached that highest amount that I would eat an earthworm. Sure enough, they reached that highest amount. Oh. And I had to eat an earthworm. And I will what say. What was it like? It was horrible tasting. It was so bad that we went out to a um, not to be named fast food restaurant with arches because I had to get some other taste in my taste. mouth. Because <laughs> it was like, first of all, the texture is yeah. because they're, they eat dirt. Like, it, you know. It's gritty. It's the nephridium. It's it's like right. They've got like the tiny little hairs. Yes. actually, like all those little it's, bristles. It, and it's te- so it's textured. It's almost like if you were to eat like very fine sandpaper, almost like I always pictured it would be like eating a tongue. I've never eaten a tongue. Well, me neither. <laughs> but like you know, like slightly textured and slimy and squishy. It was. It wasn't slimy at all. I I will say that it was not slimy at. Oh, wow. And if I would have, when I crunched down, it was a very... Oh, you chewed? I think I would have just swallowed. And see, that's what I was debating. Because I was like, mealworm, boom, swallow. Cricket, 
crunch swallow hurry up crunch because i was like i cannot swallow a cricket hole that's gross so i had to kill it and so earthworm in my mind i'm like what the heck am i doing and of course i had i had to do all of them because that was the other stipulation is like if i got the earthworm it wasn't just an earthworm it was so it was as the kids would raise that amount i would be like eat an earthworm eat a cricket eat you know uh, or eat a cricket than earthworm and so yeah so it was something like i crunched down and i hit What's, is that the nephrium? What's the sack that they have in them? Yeah, uh, I was going to bring it up. It's the satellum. Yes, okay. I think that's what I hit. Because it's that's <laughs> the reproductive organ. Yeah. Maybe that's <laughs> not what I hit. But I crunched down. It's that band, that thick band around their body. No, it wasn't that. It definitely, it was something inside of them that like when it, I could feel it like slightly pop. Oh. And then it was like. They have a crop. Maybe, I don't know, but it was like an instant disgusting taste. No Stop, amount of water foul. could get that out of my mouth. And to this day, I'm like, nope. I And I have since, I've eaten mealworms and I've totally eaten crickets to like freak people out. Um, never again why I eat an earthworm. So continue. Well, there you go, kids. <laughs> Raise enough money and Katie will eat a mealworm. <laughs> <laughs> and don't eat worms because it tastes bad. It tastes horrible. <laughs> um... Wow. Well, although they might not look like much or taste like much, their bodies are pretty amazing. Um, So they're made up of segments, which they're like compartments. They're like little compartment animals built on each other. um, And they're covered in super tiny bristles. They have muscles and nerves just like we do. um, (laughs) And they feel bad. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I'm about to anthropomorphize them. Oh, no. (laughs) Uh, they do have a mouth and an anus, so there's a front end and a back end to a worm. The front end is the one that's closest to the smooth band around its body. So there's like a big thick band on a worm, and that's the satellum, and that's their reproductive organ. Is is and that the, is the big thick band? Is that a, a trait of a, of all earthworms? I don't know. That's a good question. Okay. Because I feel like I've seen red wigglers, which are really small, and they don't have that. True. But I think I think that all worms do have to have it. Hmm. To a degree, because it's their reproductive. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Because that thing, so they're hermaphrodites, which means, you know, they're both sexes. Makes eating, m- mating, real simple. <laughs> um, <laughs> makes eating real simple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, anyway, so then that little band, like, rolls off their body into an egg case. Dude. It's bizarro. Yeah, that is um, weird. <laughs> because they're segmented if a worm's cut in half the head half can live and actually regrow its tail but it is a myth that you can make two worms the bottom half's going to die <laughs> <laughs> just keep chopping it up into more worms yeah that's nope, how you were gonna start your worm farm which is oh jeez <laughs> no way <laughs> i actually to this day feel bad because sometimes i have to feed uh i feed worms occasionally to you know our turtles and our our toads and like, normally, death is quick, and so it doesn't make me feel bad, but I hate when I have to pinch one in half for the Ooh, toads. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm like, Ugh, I don't like to have to do it. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, why are worms important? They are decomposers, just like roly-polies. They eat dead indicating matter in the form of soil, and they eat soil. Lots, lots. and lots of soil. Sometimes, up to a third of their body weight per day. That, so What? Yeah, so I wish I could eat a third of my body weight a day. I mean, you probably could, (laughs) but like, oh my gosh, (laughs) that's so much food. I bet soil is pretty low in calories, though. (laughs) Or they're just having, they're constantly moving. (laughs) Yeah, they're exercising. (laughs) Um, We absolutely need worms, they are completely vital to healthy soil. So, um, if there was any doubt about roly polies, there is no doubt about worms, okay? Their poop, also known as casts, provide homes to tons of beneficial Mm -hmm. microbes and bacteria. They turn the soil over and distribute nutrients. Um, And it's claimed that they can turn over the top six inches of soil in an area in 10 to 20 years. So they're like... That's pretty impressive. Slow motion hose. (laughs) (laughs) As I said it, I realized how it would sound... I I didn't mean it that way. I meant the gardening hoe. Okay, okay. I I got it. It's just, yeah. I just Um, wasn't expecting. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, Slow um, motion hose. Josh, please don't draw that. (laughs) Uh, 
their tunnels that they make allow water to filter through the ground. They break up soil that creates pockets that increases the water holding capacity of the soil. Their tunnels provide channels for roots to follow. And they bury dead and decaying matter and turn it back into nutrients. So worms are freaking powerhouses. Yes. They do a lot for us. And we never, we never <laughs> most people do not appreciate them. And they just let them die on the sidewalks. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or eat them, apparently. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's that's a good one. That was good. Good, good. All right. So those are our, uh, hopefully, we've changed your mind a little bit on creepy crawlies. And, you know, even if you don't like them, hopefully you can at least appreciate yes. them. And, and that, that's all we're asking. Yeah, just appreciation. <laughs> if If you can't handle a monarch butterfly walking on you, you can at least appreciate the role that it plays in the ecosystem. And same thing with everything else. Yeah, we do a program with worms uh, where I work, and uh, I'm always, I love seeing the different reactions that kids have, Mm -hmm. and then how that changes over the program. Yes. Because half the kids are on board, ready for the worm. The other half are, like, squealing. Yes. And then by the end, though, they're all so intrigued. Like, they all all want to know about it. And, like, touch it and poke it and, Yeah. That's I just good. have to remind them to be gentle because we're giant. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> just remember, children, gentle. Alrighty. Well, thank you guys for listening. Um, episode seven. We are officially done with this episode, and I yeah, guess I guess we've we made did it. Make it. Yeah, we, we made it. We made it. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Please follow us on all um, social media: on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, uh, at FTLON Podcast. Um, we post all sorts of pictures and uh, some more content and uh, to supplement and kind of add to all these episodes. So, um, and that's the easiest way to reach out to us and let us know what you're thinking what you liked about the episodes what you didn't like about the episodes um and what's your favorite insect so maybe let us know uh if you have a favorite creepy crawly let us comment and let us know yeah tune in next week everybody